Our scripture this morning, we are continuing through 1 Samuel into chapter 15, and it's verses 1 through 3, 8, and 10 through 17, and then we'll read from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. You'll find this in the insert in your bulletin. First Samuel 15. God said to Samuel, to Saul, excuse me, roll that back. Samuel said to Saul, <laughs> I was sent by the dread God to anoint you ruler over God's people, over Israel. Now then, hearken to the words of the inscrutable God. Thus says the sovereign of heaven's vanguard, I will punish Amalek for what they did to Israel, setting against them in their ascent from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and put to holy destruction all that they have. Do not spare them and put to them to death from woman to man and from infant to nursing baby and from ox to sheep, from camel to donkey. Saul seized a god ruler of the Amalekites alive and put to holy destruction all the people at the edge of the sword. The word of the sovereign God to Samuel was, I regret that I crowned Saul as ruler, for he has turned away from me and my commands he has not instituted. And Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, and it was told to Samuel. Saul went to Carmel, where he erected a monument for himself, then turned around and passed by, going down to Gilgal. Now Samuel came to him, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you, the Holy One of old. By the Holy One of old, I have instituted the command of the Holy One of Sinai. Then Samuel said, What is this sound of sheep in my ears and the sound of cattle I am hearing? And Saul said, They brought them from the Amalekites, where the people spared the best of the sheep and cattle to sacrifice to the Holy One, your God. But the rest we have put to holy destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop, let me tell you what the ancient one said to me last night. Saul replied, speak. Samuel said, though you are small in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Holy One anointed you ruler over Israel. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the utterance of the dread God and your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now then, I pray, pardon my sin and return with me so that I may worship the Holy One of old. And for Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be subject to judgment. But I say to you, I say to you all that if you are angry with a sister or brother, you will be liable to judgment. And if you call a sister or brother an idiot, you will be subject to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be subject to the hell of fire. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and you remember that your sister or brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your sister or brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to favorable terms quickly with your accuser while you are on your way with them, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the court officer, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Please pray with me. Holy One, we seek your wisdom as we search through the stories of your scripture, seeking your love and your grace. Help us to discern between the desires of humanity and your own as we read and hear from your words. We are told that you are just and righteous, and we praise you. Reveal in us your justice and righteousness and your willingness to be forgiven, as well as, well as a willingness to forgive. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
In today's scripture from 1 Samuel, we hear God give an order to slaughter an entire people, the Amalekites, from men, women to men to infants. Sometimes I hear about the angry God of the First Testament in contrast to the God of Jesus and the New, as if there were more than one God in the Bible. And while we might come to an agreement that there is one God, we might disagree about how we understand the stories in the First Testament like this one we heard in 1 Samuel 15. The story's purpose for being told to us is the fall of Saul, his demise, his loss of favorability, preparing us for the selection of the beloved David. One of the ways to view this story and understand it is that it is being told in retrospect. It's being told several generations later than it happened. Time had passed since the events being described, so they are told not just to tell what happened, but to fulfill the purpose of the storyteller, and not necessarily for the sake of historical accuracy. In other words, we're told this story so that, Paul is, so that Saul is diminished, so that David could be built up as the better choice. The story casts God giving Saul a harsh and violent order because of their opposition to the Israelites as they sojourned from Egypt to the promised land. Saul was told to destroy every living thing of the Amalekites, women, men, infants, children, all of their animals too, ox, sheep, camels, donkeys. (laughs) The ruler Agag was taken alive, at least for a while, Then God, because Saul had not been 100% obedient, told Samuel that God's choice of Saul was regretted, rejected, and that Saul would be out. Samuel was angry, possibly at God, possibly at Saul, probably at both. So he spent all night crying out in prayer before he went to Saul. And when he finally found him, He knew that Saul's army had slaughtered all the people of Amalek. But the people had argued, the people of Israel, had argued that the sheep and cattle should not be killed. So they said they could be sacrificed to God. God, through Samuel, wondered, raged, do you not know how that you are their ruler? That if Saul were truly their ruler, head of the tribes of Israel, why did he follow the argument of the people rather than the utterance of the dread God, as Dr. Gaffney translates it? Why did he slaughter the people and save their wealth? Well, in our story, Saul confessed, repented, explained that he followed the people instead of God and wanted to be forgiven. And that's probably the reason that this story is told. Saul is portrayed as a weak ruler, someone who cannot do what God says and does what the people say. We might see that as a plus in our democratic world, but it was not seen that way at that point. He did what was popular instead of God's order. The first question when I read these texts like this that are hard to swallow is I ask if this story is accurate or beyond what is told here in the text. Is is God known to be genocidal? Many of the stories of God's willingness to commit genocide here in this place and also in Joshua, which is the place where we see a lot of that. Um, In Joshua... Joshua said, was said to destroy 18 of 19 Canaanite cities. But when we look at the actual historical record, like the um, archaeology, that probably didn't happen. It was more likely that the people of Israel, the people that had come from Egypt, dwelt mostly peacefully with those who were already there. 
But we can't let go of the question of why it is that people wanted to cast God or Samuel willing to commit that kind of violence. So we can continue to struggle with it. We don't have to say that's okay because God said it. But we do have to remember that the story is told for a particular purpose, to paint Saul in the worst of lights. Not only did he not argue about the, against the destruction of entire, an entire people, which had been done before successfully, he didn't kill the most valuable of their livestock. He killed the people and saved the animals. The story of violence and destruction not only signifies Saul's fate, the beginning of the end of his rule, but the beginning of the destruction of his family. We also have to remember that he was not alone in this. Missing from the story are the women, his wives, his daughters. His fall from failure led not his fall from favor led not only to his removal as ruler, but to the introduction of David into the lives of these women. And if we know anything about David, that's not necessarily a plus. David would be engaged to both of Saul's daughters, married and abandoning one, and then killing several of their children by his order, the children that were not his offspring and his descendants. When we read these stories of the enemies and friends of God, of Israel, it's vital that we remember the reality of the violence they describe, and then ask questions about what historical evidence that there is for the facts they contain. From my theological viewpoint, or the way that I understand God to behave, to be, I do wonder why nobody questioned this slaughtering of children. This slaughtering of even women and men who were not, or shouldn't be held accountable for the actions of their ancestors. The Amalekites who had harassed the Israelites as they crossed the wilderness were generations in the past. Perhaps they had gained advantages by their actions, but it seems that their outright slaughter was excessively harsh generations later. But we hear the story to show why David, who would also make questionable and questionably unethical and violent choices would be chosen to replace Saul. It's important to set these stories into their context to understand them. It's important to realize that of all the scriptures, all the stories we read in scripture, the first and the New Testament were written and have been interpreted by human beings for thousands of years. They contain the word of God and they contain the bias of those we received them from. One of the things that I learned from the text of many stories in the First Testament or Hebrew Scriptures or Old Testament is that they require us to question their origins, their purpose, their development over time, the layers of story that have come on top of them. While this story about Saul's loss of favor shows us how we get eventually from Saul to David, we also read that Saul recognized his weakness that he followed and desired the popularity of the people before he chose to be in awe of God. And that usually means poor choices. We see in this text that he recognized his need to pray and be pardoned before he went to worship. And I think that's probably the best connection we can make from this text to the gospel text from Matthew. This text from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount as he looks to the Torah and invites questions and explanations, you have heard it said, I say to you, over and over. He, like many Jewish teachers, created a fence around the law, sort of kept distant from the actual core of the law so that there wouldn't be any disobedience accidentally. Making sure that there was little chance to actually breaking a particular law, like murder, he only explained that tearing down a per he not only explained that tearing down a person was like murder, setting that person apart, making them seem less human, might make them easier to fulfill that killing. And he continued that one could not be in genuine worship if one had unreconciled sin. 
but that not facing sin created a barrier between the worshiper and God. Saul recognized a sin, the sin of disobedience, certainly, but also not having the strength and fortitude to recognize when violence became the answer instead of the last resort. And when he recognized that sin, he confessed. In the larger saga of the kings of Israel, the damage had already been done. We're already headed toward David. But in that moment, in his personal relationship, if, there, if we can describe it that way, he came back to a place of connection to God and to Samuel, God's messenger. It was not right and would never be right to slaughter an entire people, women, men, and children, plus all of their animals. And I don't really see how we can justify the story. We can understand that it's told for a reason. We can also glean from it that Saul, even presented in this bad light, saw his sin. He wasn't completely bad. The people were greedy for the livestock and he allowed it, probably being greedy himself. And Jesus' words of interpretation, as he presented his understanding of the law, help us to hear that we will be in need of forgiveness from God as we worship, and that there are people in our lives we should also seek forgiveness from as well. And, I would add, there are people in our lives that should be asking us for forgiveness. We've been hurt, but that part's beyond our power, so we just have to take care of what we can. The God we worship is the God of Samuel, Saul, and Jesus. God is still faithful, just, and righteous, righteous, whatever stories we are told that say different. And we can learn to discern, to recognize when those stories tell us who God is and who God is not. To the glory of God, Love eternal, holy, and most high. Amen.